Hello, and welcome back to your fourth vodcast for Chapter 10, uh, our study of imperialism. This section is called America as a World Power. We're going to get into the Roosevelt Corollary, Roosevelt dealing with world powers, the building of the Panama Canal, and a few other foreign policies of presidents that follow uh, William McKinley. A few objectives you'll learn, or should things you should know by the time we finish. And let's get to it. First, Teddy Roosevelt becomes president after William McKinley is shot. We'll talk about that in class uh, ever so briefly. McKinley is shot. He's the, the, his assassin claims that McKinley was the enemy of the people. Uh, we'll talk about it. The guy who shot him was an anarchist. Um, we'll get into that. He was shot at the World's Fair. But uh, on to Roosevelt. He, t he swears in, uh, takes the oath of office, and uh, almost immediately... Um, Japan and Russia approached President Roosevelt to work out some uh, problems between the two countries. Japan and Russia have been fighting um, over pieces of land in that in the area between the two countries, and neither side were gaining anything. Basically, both sides were out of money. Uh, the the war between Russia and Japan had cost both sides a tremendous amount of lives and property and damage and everything. And neither side wants to admit to the other side that they can't go on, so they approach. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt. They meet in New Hampshire, and uh, a deal's work out worked out where uh, both sides get a little bit of what they wanted, and the war is over. Historians uh, would some some historians believe that Roosevelt really didn't earn this Nobel Peace Prize for his work with Russia and Japan. Uh, in fact, some say that he sat the two representatives from the countries down in a room and told them they needed to work it out, and then he went off and did whatever it was that he he did. Either way. Uh, Roosevelt does win the Nobel Peace Prize for uh, mediating between the two countries, uh, resulting in the end of the Japanese uh, Russo-Japanese War. All right, back to the Panama Canal. Um, for a long time, people have, have wanted a canal to be built across somewhere in Central America just to alleviate the long passage around uh, South America. Um, Panama was picked... Uh, after Nicaragua. Nicaragua was looked at. Nicaragua was too mountainous, too high, too rocky, and so they decided upon Panama. The problem with the building in Panama is that Panama was a territory of Colombia, so in order to build in Panama, you had to get the rights and the privilege or uh, the permission from the country of Pan uh, Colombia. Well, Colombia had given the permission to build the canal to a French company, the same French company who had built, this, built the Suez Canal. So the French company starting building in. The United States doesn't like this because they see that as a violation of the Monroe Doctrine, uh, the, the doctrine that states no foreign interference in our hemisphere will be uh, accepted. So they see the French as a foreign interference because were, we were worried that the French might uh, stay, even though the French building company and the French government declared that they were politically neutral. The United States didn't buy it. They didn't like it. The United States petitioned Colombia for the right to build. Colombia says no. Uh, the talks between the U.S. representative and the Colombian representative were not going well at all, and the, the, they ended with the American uh, representative saying, well, we really hope that you know, things go well in Panama. We hope that there would be no rebellion and you would lose that property, kind of foreshadowing, basically saying the only way we can build the canal is to get the people of Panama to give us the right to build the Panet Canal. The only way they will be able to give us the right is if they gain their independence from Colombia. So a little foreshadowing there. There is going to be a re rebellion in Panama, and Panama will eventually gain its independence. We'll get to that in just a second. <clears throat> Jumping ahead, we do build the canal. We pay Panama $10 million uh, up front, and then $250,000 in your rent. That lasted until 1999. In 1999, we formally gave control of the canal over to Panama. Um, constructing the canal was difficult. The French company that was in, in charge of building the canal experienced all kinds of problems and essentially ran out of money battling these non-construction problems, yellow fever, malaria, uh, soil is just caving in under their feet. Um, they basically ran out of money and went bankrupt and they couldn't finish. The uh, people of Panama do gain their independence um, with the slight help of the United States. Um, and then Panama gives the United States the right to build the canal. Congress paid $25 million to Colombia to compensate for the loss of, Pan of Panama. 
So we're sorry you lost your canal. We, we're, we're sorry you lost your territory. Here's some money to make you feel better. Uh, when the Panamanians begin the revolt, the United States sent a couple of Navy ships down to the ports of Panama to prevent any Colombian ship from getting in, which would have essentially stopped the, uh, the building of the canal, or excuse me, the, the rebellion. So our ships stopped their ships from getting in. The rebellion uh, is successful. Panama gains their freedom. Um, and almost immediately they give us the rights to build the canal and the rest is history. Roosevelt Corollary. This is Roosevelt's belief is on foreign policy. Roosevelt's foreign policy. He takes the Monroe Doctrine and extends it uh, all the way down into Latin America, Central America, and South America. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine originally uh, encompassed just the continental United States, just the shape of the United States that we would know today. Uh, down to Florida and Texas, all the way over to, of, uh, yeah, Florida. I said that. Okay, just that. Roosevelt um, extends it all the way down to Central America, South America. His policy in slang, or in, in short, speak softly and carry a big stick. Tell the people, here's what you want. Tell the people, here's how we're going to do it. And when they don't agree, you beat them over the head until they do agree. Basically, that's all there was to it. Um, it worked. People listened to Roosevelt. People listened to the United States. We may have been uh, considered or looked at as a bully, but things went well for the most part. After Roosevelt, uh, his term ends, uh, William Taft, William Howard Taft takes over. I'll write his name in here so you know. Taft succeeds um, Roosevelt uh, in the next election. Uh, Taft has the policy of throwing money at the situation. He doesn't agree with force. Um, Nicaragua is in a difficult situation, so we loan Nicaragua some money to pay off their debts. As a result, our banks have a right to control their, uh, their tariffs. So we're taking a portion of their tariffs to recover the money we loan to them. And this makes the Nicaraguan businesses uh, very upset because obviously they're losing money. Um, so it doesn't work very well and you know money runs out eventually. It's not a very popular policy at all. Woodrow Wilson follows Taft. Uh, he's elected ne the next president and his foreign policy is to give it a moral tone. Um, Wilson's policy is known as missionary diplomacy and if you know anything about the word missionary it usually means peaceful. Uh, it's usually church driven. Uh, and Woodrow Wilson was heavy in the church. Um, so his was more of a, uh, let's just sit down and talk about our problems and see if we can work them out diplomatically. Um, again, not very successful uh, when you have one group of people who are intent on being violent and you try to talk with them, uh, nothing, nothing gets solved. Um, here's a good example of the missionary diplomacy failing. Um, in Mexico, they had several rebellions. They had just recently gained their independence from Spain, and uh, leadership was in question. Francisco Madera overthrew the old government, so that means he took it what, by force. Um, and I believe Madera had the support of the United States but he did not have the support of the Mexican people because he wasn't able to follow through with his promises. General Huerta kills Madera or has Madera killed, so another coup or, or an overthrow, a forceful overthrow of the president. Um, the United States refuses to recognize Huerta because he's going to rule as a dictator, as a tyrant, while Madera was going to be democratic and was unsuccessful. Huerta was going to be diplomat or dem uh, dictator uh, tyrant like uh, again, yeah again Wilson refused to recognize Huerta's government um, Wilson and in an effort to restore order or help restore order on Mexico because again right there next to the United States and it, any any issues with a Latin American country could affect our security so we send troops down um, he sends uh, Wilson sends troops to uh, protect American citizens um, United States and Mexico are unwilling to sit down and talk and uh, eventually Huerta's uh, regime collapses and uh, Carranza, 
comes in and takes over. The um, United States supports Carranza because, like Madera, he wants to have a democratic style government. When Carranza takes over, the U.S. troops are pulled back into the United States. Um, unfortunately, Carranza did not have the full support of the Mexican people, just like Madera. Um, he is opposed, opposed by probably one of the most violent criminals of the time in Mexico, Pancho Villa and Emilio Zapata. And uh, Pancho Villa realizes that if the leader of Mexico, whoever that may be, has the approval of the United States, then they're going to be successful because there's the power and the money with the United, that comes with the United States approval. So Villa asks for Wilson's approval. Wilson says uh, no because you don't have the, the, the right to govern Mexico, and Wilson stays behind Carranza. Um, Villa, Villa, as a result, begins killing American mine workers. Uh, one incident, uh, we had a train pull in, and several Americans get off the train, and the moment they step off, they are um, basically mowed down by Villa and his men. Uh, that results in uh, Wilson sending uh, troops to Mexico to uh, apprehend Pancho Villa. Uh, he sends a guy you might know, General John J. Persing, from the state of Missouri, uh, in the army, and his, his, he's given the the, uh, the command to capture Pancho Villa, dead or alive. 150,000 National Guards are sent to, to Mexico, and they literally they wander all over Mexico looking for Villa, and uh, then they are never successful. They never find him. Carranza doesn't like the, the United States troops in Mexico because it looks like there's going to be war. Eventually, uh, the, the problems settle down. Wilson gives up on trying to capture Villa. And um, there's a little issue in Europe with a world war that was starting, and we did not need to be fighting a battle on two fronts. So Wilson pulls the, uh, the troops out of Mexico, brings them home in preparation for this war in Europe. Carranza, even though he had the support of the United States, rules as a dictator, until 1921. All of this intervention from the very first uh, point to now is basically the groundwork, the model for the United States over the next few years. The imperialist belief of America that it's our right, it's our duty, it's our responsibility to intervene if the United States um, security appears to be threatened. And we would use military force if need be. Okay. Thanks, guys, for listening. We'll see you later.